Now, first of all, I thought the bank would loan me money to, um, to buy the games. And as it turned out, the bank didn't want to loan money. The games were around $3,000 a piece, and you know, the bank didn't want to loan any money on a, a video game that they thought could be torn up or be worthless um, and would have no asset value. So they just basically said, no, we're not going to loan you any money. So my only option, I didn't have, you know, had $30,000 and I said, you know, keep a little bit for operating capital. It gives you twenty to twenty-five thousand to um, you know to open to to populate games. Well, twenty thousand dollars that'll get maybe six or seven games. Well, six or seven games is not enough to have a video game parlor with um, you know the energy and the excitement that you need to have for that to be a success. So, uh, so rather than go out and buy six games and put in there and just see what happened. I hired a, uh, entered into a relationship with a video game vendor, and the vendor agreed to put games in the parlor in exchange for 50% of the take. And uh, so he put in about 10 or 12 games, and that still wasn't enough. It was more than I could put in, but see, I suddenly discovered that his interest and my interests were at odds with each other. His goal was to put the fewest number of games in that he could because the maximum revenue per game would occur. My goal was to get the maximum number of games in because even if the revenue per game was down, the total revenue would be up and I would get 50% of it. So we entered into a contract and then we suddenly discovered that we really weren't seeing eye to eye on things and after about five or six months, we came to an agreement where he left and another vendor came in with more games and at that point in time, the business was actually doing reasonably well, but there was still a problem and that problem was that even with a room full of games that were that were good games, um, we still were only getting 50% of the take. And as it turns out, that just wasn't enough for the business to really, really thrive upon. Um, so we ended up having to shut it down. But the real, the real crux of that was that um, that the street that we were on, the buildings on that street were condemned because the city had decided to take possession of that street for expansion of a freeway that was going through that was being expanded and they needed that street that we were on, the properties, to build an on-ramp. So uh, literally at about the one year point uh, we were condemned out of business and uh, that business had a lot of debts and uh, somebody had had to guarantee the debts and uh, so I as the president of the business had stepped up and had guaranteed the debts. and. Uh, when the business went out of business because of the condemnation of the property and closing it down, we had unpaid debts that we had to pay. So I went to my investors and said, hey guys, why don't you kick in some money and let's take care of this. And they said, hey Lee, tough luck, you know, you shouldn't have guaranteed the debts. So I was in a situation where I had no income, I had no job, I had no business to create any revenue, and I had guaranteed a bunch of corporate debts. And at that time it was around thirty-five or 40000 and this was... 1983, 84, and I just couldn't afford to pay those off, so I declared personal bankruptcy, Chapter 7, and wiped the debts out. Now, that was a very traumatic thing for me to go through because I really, up to that point in time, it felt like uh, it was really a bad thing to, to go through a bankruptcy. Somehow, people that went through bankruptcies were bad people, and that really weighed on me for a long time. But I had taken about a year out of the accounting profession to to do this video game thing, so I went back into public accounting, got a job with um, uh, with a small public accounting firm, worked with them for about a year, finished my finished got my um, the, the CPA exam under my belt and became a licensed CPA, and I started my own CPA firm with a friend. And for about three years, up until about 1986, I um, ran a, a successful little CPA practice, and we had. Um, you know, a couple of employees and my partner and I. And um, um, unfortunately, the the CPA practice was not one that I really enjoyed. I, you know, was reasonably good at it, and my job more than anything was to go out and raise, uh, you know, create uh, clients to 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 grow or to do the marketing to to bring in new clients. And my my partner would do a little bit more of the work. I'd do a little bit more of the you know the client acquisition and. So we kind of divided things up that way, but, but during the busy season, we worked a lot. We worked a lot. My third busy season, 10 weeks in a row, I spent over 100 hours a week in the office every week for those 10 weeks, and some of those weeks, 120 hours in the office. And as you can well imagine, that was burnout level of, 
uh, work. And so, um, you know, as it turns out, that third tax season on um, April 17th, two days after the April 15th deadline, my dad passed away. And uh, because of the burnout and because of the fact that he had passed away, I basically kind of just hit the wall and I said, I'm getting out. So I, I fire sold my business to my partner and I just got out of the business and I really didn't have anything you know, to do. Um, but I wasn't terribly worried about it. And it turned out that um, a month or two later, one of my uh, accounting clients for the CPA firm, I kept a few of them just to do the books to have some, some cash flow. And, one of my clients was a couple of doctors of optometry in, in Fort Worth, and they had a small practice, and they were, um, they were trying to figure out, this was around 1986, they were trying to figure out how to compete with lens crafters. Now, you may not remember this time frame, but lens crafters was owned by USU, a huge conglomerate. And up to this point in time, optometry practices were we basically had an optician, an optometrist. Sometimes they would be one and the same, sometimes not. But, you know, the optometrist would uh, prescribe your glasses and the optician would fit you with frames. And then you'd, about a week later, you'd get the lenses back from the, uh, from the frame uh, laboratory or the lens laboratory and you would, uh, you know, you'd get fitted for your glasses and off you'd go. Well, lens crafters came in and, and did the big box concept where you could come in and walk out an hour later with an eye exam and a pair of glasses ready to go because they had figured out how to manufacture glasses on site for 95 percent of the clients that came through so what was a one week come in get your exam have to come back two trips long time became a, a one hour waiting period to get your glasses and it dramatically changed technology dramatically changed how that industry worked and so these clients of mine were running a small optometry shop and they were trying to figure out how to compete with lens crafters because it was decimating small shop optometrists across the nation. And so they called me up and uh, seven doctors with six offices, my, my guys were part of this team, were trying to band together to compete with lens crafters. And so I met with them and they offered me the position of executive director of a company called First Eye Care. And so I joined them and helped them grow. And so First Eye Care started off in, I think it was 86, but um, they started off with seven doctors with six offices in the Fort Worth, Tarrant County area. And over the course of one year, I helped them grow to 22 doctors with 19 offices across the, the Dallas and Fort Worth metropolitan area. And so we did pretty good. We grew rapidly. We, had, we, had negotiate, we negotiated in bulk with, um, with advertising opportunities, so we, we got better deals on advertising. We, we, we got better deals on frames, we got better deals on lenses, we, we centralized a lot of things that had been piecemealed out, so it was a very efficient operation. They all used the name First Eye Care, but they were independent doctors of optometry. It wasn't a franchise, but it was sort of being operated like a, a franchise, and bottom line is, is it was a successful little operation, but after one year they'd gone, they'd grown as large as they wanted to grow and they didn't really want anybody else in because it would start infringing upon the existing sort of territorial um, boundaries of the existing doctors so they quit growing. I was um, interested in continuing to grow. Young man, anxious to grow my, my personal, <clears throat> anxious to grow my personal, um, you know, opportunities. So, so um, I began to sort of look around for other things. And there was a, a medical doctor management group called Omega Health.